the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So in the last few weeks, we have, as we said to the children, entered into this story of Abraham and his family. We've seen God's choice of this man and his descendants, God's plan to work through this family in order to bless and redeem the world. We've heard the extraordinary promises that God spoke to Abraham, promises of generations of children, of a land to live in, of blessing and purpose. We've witnessed the struggles of this family as well dealing with love and jealousy, compassion and cruelty, new life and the shadow of death. And in these stories, we've seen God working through these complicated, messy human lives to be faithful to God's promises. And today we move on from Abraham and Sarah to the next generation, to Isaac, the child of the promise. And through the story of Isaac and eventually his wife, Rebecca, We see that while God's purpose is consistent, God's movement doesn't follow all the same patterns in every life. In the story of Abraham and Sarah, there was a lot of dramatic intervention by God. But this story is different. There's no voice from heaven, no mysterious divine visitors, no clear miracles. There's just faithfulness lived out in everyday life. And so maybe we can relate to Isaac and Rebecca's story a little easier. Not that most of us have had experiences quite like we see here, being sent to pick a bride from another land, using camels as a part of divine revelation, or being willing to marry someone you've never met. But we can relate to the idea of seeking God's will in the, and leading in the tasks and opportunities of everyday life. We heard pieces of Isaac and Rebecca's longer story read a few minutes ago. When the story begins, Sarah has died, Abraham is very old, and Isaac is 40 years old. Like many parents, Abraham wants to see his child settled before he dies. And in the case of this family, Isaac's lack of a wife is even more a cause for concern. Once again, the promise of descendants and a nation seems threatened. And so Abraham devises a plan to find a son for his wife. He doesn't want Isaac to marry a local girl. Instead, he commissions his most trusted servant to return to Haran, where the rest of Abraham's family had remained, and to find a wife for Isaac there among Abraham's people. Now, as far as the storyline is concerned, this unnamed servant is just a vehicle for advancing Isaac's story. But he's worth paying attention to because he is definitely a person of faith, and the path that he takes in approaching this task provides us with a good model for seeking God's leading in whatever we undertake. The job that Abraham gives his servant is a fairly difficult one, even in that day and age. He has to travel to a different land, choose a good wife for his master's son and heir, 
and bring her back to marry someone she has never met. The servant prepares for his journey as well as he can, loading up many of the ten camels he brings with choice gifts, as the story says, for the woman and her family. When he arrives in Haran, in the city of Nahor, he chooses a strategic location to begin his search for Isaac's wife. He plants himself beside the town's well, just at the time when the women would be coming to draw water for their families. And then he prays for God to grant him success. Interestingly, he gives God a pretty precise scenario to work with. When I say, please give me some water to a girl, and she gives me water and also offers to give water to my camels, let that be the girl that I'm supposed to choose. Maybe being specific is good. A friend who lives in Montana where they just had those earthquakes the other day shared a Facebook post of a friend of hers. It said, my bad everybody, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit shows up and shakes us awake. I was thinking in a spiritual sense. Guess I'll have to be more specific next time. <laughs> At any rate, in the case of Abraham's servant, he doesn't trust only in his own preparation and strategy, though those are important. He sees his task framed within God's faithfulness and steadfast love. And he prays that God will guide him to success and grant him a sign. Then comes a time of waiting and watching as he tries to discern God's leading in what is happening around him. He has barely finished praying when a woman approaches the well. Everything takes place just as he had imagined and hoped. When he asks her for water, she offers some to him and then gives water to his camels. Now, this is no small task, by the way. There are 10 camels, and they each can drink 20 to 30 gallons of water at a time. It gives the servant plenty of time to observe the woman and to look for signs of God's hand in what was taking place. Ultimately, he's pleased with what he sees. The woman is from Abraham's own family, and she has shown the generosity and the strength that he hoped to reveal. Having discerned that the sign he asked for has been fulfilled and that what is happening is God's doing, the servant is then quick to praise God, bowing his head in prayers of thanksgiving. The servant gives the young woman, Rebecca, costly gold jewelry and asks if he might stay at her house. When he arrives at her home, he is welcomed by Rebecca's family, including her brother Laban, who, as we will learn in future stories, has a keen eye for opportunity and appreciation for wealth. Right away, as soon as the servant is in the house, before he will even eat anything, he tells the family the story of what has happened, bearing witness to how God has been at work in their lives through this encounter. His testimony, and probably also his forethought in having brought lots of gifts, convinced Rebecca's brother and father that this is indeed God's doing and will. Rebecca is on board as well. When the men ask her if she's willing to leave the next day with Abraham's servant, or if she'd rather wait a week or so, <coughs> excuse me, she courageously sets off, tracing Abraham's own journey of many years before, going where God's story is leading her. When they arrive in the Negev, they find Isaac walking in the field. Rebecca is introduced, and the story is told. Isaac marries Rebecca and loves her, and so the story of Abraham's family moves on to its next chapter, God's promises still unbroken. Through Isaac and Rebekah's story, just as through Abraham and Sarah's, God's promise is continuing to work itself out in the lives of this family. In some cases, there are the voices from heaven and the unexplainable miracles. In others, God intervenes which, with much less fanfare. And that's how it is for all of us. You may have experienced God's work in your life in any number of ways, things that seemed dramatic and clear, or prayers that were answered, or just nudges that you didn't ignore. The servant of Abraham in today's story gives us a picture of what it looks like to be open and responsive to God's leading, however it comes to us. First, he prepares as much as he can, and then leaves it in God's hands. Trusting God's presence and work in our lives doesn't mean that we are just waiting for God to make everything happen. God works in and through real human lives in all their complexity, and our choices and our actions matter. 
God doesn't control all that happens like a master puppeteer. But neither is everything in our hands. God can use what we do and the circumstances we find ourselves in to accomplish God's purposes, weaving them into the story that God is writing. Abraham's servant does all that he can to ensure that his project has the best chance it can, but he prays for God to give it success that he is hoping for, to use what the servant is doing to reveal God's will and faithfulness. And then the servant has to wait and watch. He interacts with his surroundings, expecting God to show up, to be moving and guiding. He is alert to seeing what God is doing. He doesn't hear a voice from heaven or receive an angelic messenger, but by paying attention and trusting God, he becomes aware of God's leading. He's able to interpret his interaction with Rebecca as an answer to his prayer, a sign of God's presence and leading, not just a happy coincidence. Granted, it seems to be a much clearer and quicker answer to prayer than we might feel we often receive, but still, if we are not paying attention, we can miss all sorts of things that God is doing. And the servant has to be both alert and expectant to what is happening. Finally, the servant's response is important. As soon as he becomes convinced that Rebecca is the one God is leading him to, he Im immediately responds with worship. He bows his head and praises God, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and faithfulness to Abraham or for that matter, to the servant himself. And then when he meets the family, he immediately witnesses, not just telling the story, but interpreting it in light of God's promises, God, claiming God's acting and purpose in what has taken place. When we are trusting God to be at work and are alert to God's movement around us, this response flows naturally. We immediately want to thank God and to tell others about what God has done for us. Our inhibitions can choke this off, but it's what the Spirit moves us to when we see God at work in our lives. How has God been at work in your life this week? It's what these stories are calling us to pay attention to. God has promised to be moving in our lives, working for healing and renewal, forgiveness and reconciliation, conforming our lives to Jesus' own life so that through us, God's blessing and new life can be made known throughout the world. God is always working those promises out in our lives, always breaking in to make them alive and transformative in us, in ways both visible and hidden. The weaving that is on our loom in the narthex has been growing over the last few weeks as you all reflect on that, weaving in fabric to represent your stories each week in their beauty and in their brokenness. I hope you will all continue to do so, filling our loom with all of our stories. And hopefully you've noticed the gold ribbon that is running across it, the thread of God's promise, unbroken. God is at work in our lives. In Jesus, we have the assurance that we too are part of God's chosen people, heirs to the promise, and that God's love for the world is so great that not evil or death itself can defeat it. May we learn from Abraham's servant this week as we seek to be faithful in the lives that await us when we leave these doors later today. May we take up his pattern, preparing and praying, waiting and watching, praising and witnessing, for God will continue to be faithful. Amen. <laughs>